How's everyone feeling today? You still fresh despite the fact that it's a little bit late and a little bit hot in Singapore today? Uh, well, obviously not inside, luckily. Uh, so welcome to my presentation. Um, so I'm Niels. Um, let me tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I was born in Germany many years ago, lived in Holland for a while, moved to Indonesia three years ago. So technically I'm a neighbor of Singapore. Um, for the previous three years I was a, a WordPress freelance developer, um, done multiple customizations on WordPress.org, um, WooCommerce, I wrote plugins, created themes, um, I'm organizing WordCamps in Denpasar and in Ubud. Um, next week, I'm actually organizing the WordCamp in Jakarta, in capital of Indonesia. So um, feel free to join by. Um, and uh, since probably two months, I'm working for Automatic, the company behind WordPress, um, which is fantastic. And uh, as the previous speaker already said, we totally treat our employees not as assets, but as friends, and, and, and we share love and happiness amongst the team um, and I think that's that's very crucial in order to to um, become a really successful company so that you don't really see employees as, as uh, um, someone who just has to do the work but but really as a as a friend so today's talk is about um, DTAP so it's a little bit more technical um, I want to share some insights uh, from my experience as a developer and the thing is what does DTAP actually stands for? So DTAP is an acronym for D as development, T for testing, A for acceptance, and P for production. So what does that mean? Um, who in here is a developer? Please raise the hands. Okay, so we have a couple of developers. Who faced the situation that you get an urgent call from a customer, you need to adjust something, you log in, you make the change, and you end up with the so-called widescreen of death? Sounds familiar? Right. Never touch a running system. It's always tricky. So the thing is, um, why should you use a DTAP environment in first place? Um, so I'm talking more about how to set it up, but the thing is, um, Oh, I'm not loud enough? Okay, thanks. Um, so why should you use a DTAP system in first place? Um, wouldn't it be much easier just to log in and do the change? Um, well, the problem is that there's always that risk that you actually bring down the site. And especially if it's an e-commerce site, um, which has a high turnover, you don't want to, to, to bring that site down at any given price. So the system needs to keep running. So the first thing you can do is what starting developers do. Um, they log into the system, they make the change, they bring the system down, they have to explain the customer that they kind of mess it up, nothing works anymore. Um, customer is frustrated, clients of the customer are frustrated, probably the developer uh, starts to get sweaty and, and, and um, worries about losing their customer. So it's not really a good relationship. Um, the next level towards a full DTAP environment is if we integrate an additional step. And even beginning developers figure that out relatively soon. Um, so a better approach is that you actually take your project offline so on the left hand side you can see the D which stands for development whereas on the right hand side you can see the P which is the production environment. So usually when you when you work on a client side you clone the site, take it down to your computer which also has the benefit that you can work offline. So if the internet connection went down which now and then happens in Indonesia, especially on Bali, um, you can still work on the project and once that project is running and, and, and you implemented all the features as um, required by the customer, you can technically upload it to the server. So that's a much better approach than to uh, operate on an open heart and, and, and by touching the production system. The problem is 
that scenario it could work on your local machine and as soon as you deploy it you can still bring that server down probably you have different software versions you have some library dependencies uh, you have different PHP versions so there are a couple of, of, of cases that can actually happen um, which still lead to an issue so example number two is a much better scenario than the example uh, number one I just see that I messed up the numbers, sorry for that. Um, so that is a much better um, scenario, but it's not perfect yet. So the next step would be if we integrate an additional stage. Um, so now you can see we have a development environment, which usually is my local machine. From the development environment, I push all my changes to a testing environment and once everything is tested and works according to the specifications, then I push it further to the production environment. Um, the big advantage of having a testing environment is usually my testing environment runs on the same server as the production environment. So I'm using the same libraries, I'm using the same uh, uh, server settings. So I know when the tests actually succeed, I can push it further to production and it might not affect anything. That is a DTP. So now the question, what is a DTAP, a DTAP environment? So and a DTAP environment is highly recommended when you deal with sensitive data. So this is how a DTAP environment looks like. So you have the development in first stage. Once the code is, is implemented, you put it to, uh, to testing. So on testing, you can run all kind of tests to see if it works. Once these tests succeed, you push it further to an acceptance environment. The acceptance environment is not for you as a developer, but it's for your customer. So your customer can run extensive checks on the functionality and see if everything works according to the specifications without touching the production system. So the production, you let the production system run until all the tests are done by the customer. So as a developer, I can play around with the, with the testing environment. I can deploy at any given time um, without affecting the customer. So, um, and once I push everything to acceptance, then it's up to the customer. And then I don't touch the acceptance system anymore. Once the customer approves all the changes, these changes can then be pushed further to the production environment. Um, and to give you an example, um, when to use such an environment, I created an application for the university in Amsterdam, the uh, hospital. Um, so they have uh, thousands of, of patient records um, and they want me to, to create that application, but at the same time, they don't want to give me access to their personal records, um, which is logical. Like I, I don't need to know these, these data and these are pretty sensitive data. So what we did actually is um, I put all my changes from development to testing. Once they're tested, I gave a sign to the IT department. The IT department then pushed my changes further to acceptance. Um, and at the same time, they took the real data from the production environment and pushed it back to the acceptance environment. So I, at any given time, I could never access the acceptance environment. But on the acceptance environment, my customer could actually check the, the, the uh, system and the new functionality, sorry for that, um, could test the, the, the implemented functionality with the real client data. So there are a couple of strategies how to do that. Um, I already mentioned one of the strategies. Um, so how to deal with, with, with changes, how to deal with content, how to deal with commits. Um, we always say changes go up, content goes down. So that means when I implement a new feature, I start from development, then I push it to testing, then I push it to acceptance, and then it goes into production at the final stage. With the content, I do the other approach. So the content, the latest version of the content is always on the production version. So from production, I actually push that content down to acceptance, from acceptance down to testing, and from testing down to development. Um, 
Of course, it depends on the customer. So in that example with the university in Amsterdam, um, they only push the data from production to acceptance and then they make a cut. And I say, okay, we don't push these data any deeper because then we release, uh, we, we, we lose control of, of these data. So you need to come up with your own test data. But if you work on a regular project, it's always a good idea when you start development that you make a dump of the database first and take that content all the way down to development implement your features and then push your features all the way up to production. So there are a couple of, of naming conventions I developed over time. So you do have development, testing, acceptance, um, production. So usually I use the subdomain DEF for development. Um, for testing I usually use alpha. For the acceptance I usually use beta um, and I don't really use www because it's simply a subdomain. Some customers like it um, because it's a little bit more traditional and it looks like a real website. Um, I had a, a few customers who told me, oh, there's a www missing. It doesn't look like a website to me. Um, well, in that case, you just add a www. Um, and this is a, a slightly different naming convention. I also use def. Uh, in, in, in that scenario. For testing, you can use testing. For the acceptance environment, you can use acceptance or you can use staging. Um, yeah, and, and with the development, you can add a www if required. That's the end of my presentation, but I'm happy to answer all your questions you have. Thanks for your uh, patience. <laughs> Yep. So my question is, how do you man manage all the four environments at once? Do you use any kind of tools or what? Um, yeah, I'm using a plugin called All-in-One WP Migration, um, which is, uh, a, a, for me, it works best because I can uh, create a dump of the entire system and move that, that dump around. Um, Usually I create an SQL export from the production system, which I bring down to my development environment and then I implement the features. And from there, I simply create a dump and, and import these dump on higher levels. Um, so for me, that works best. Um, it always depends on the environment. Um, friends of mine, they also use uh, Vagrant or they use Docker and, and um, they use automated scripts. Um, but to me personally, WP uh, all-in-one migration, that, that is my secret weapon. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's a question in the back. Just in regards to the same, uh, that same issue, what about dealing with WooCommerce and, and live order sites in terms of pushing data to so from a acceptance server straight to a live server because obviously you don't want to overwrite any live orders and things like that which can become quite troublesome so you're only pushing part of a database yeah that's a very good question when dealing with a woocommerce system i usually don't push these data around because uh, you're absolutely right if i create a dump now and i push it back in a week I would technically lose all these data so when dealing with woocommerce system um, i don't create full uh, dumps but I simply commit the, the, the single changes so um, yeah it's a little bit more tricky and, and then I really need to go through my, my git history and see okay which files did I actually change and I manually ch yeah add these files yeah after I make a backup first <laughs> any more questions yeah Like how do you do all the commits to different environments and all that? Because like this is something which like I'm not very familiar with, so maybe you can go into a bit more detail about how exactly do you do the committing and stuff. Yeah, so the question is how do I deal with version control, right? Um, so I'm using Bitbucket, um, which is kind of a replacement for GitHub. The beauty of Bitbucket is that it technically has the same functionality as, as GitHub um, with the difference that in GitHub um, you can only use it when it's open source so everyone can access the code which if you work for a, uh, for a 
paying customer, you usually don't want to open up that code and, and, and have that project available to the entire world. Um, but I use Git all the time and I truly believe that, that the more commits you do, the better it is. So I don't implement massive features, but I break it down into really small um, user stories or small requests. I implement just a, a single request at a given time. I commit it and then I do the next one and the next one and the next one. And that gives me the flexibility that, that when something breaks, I can always do a rollback to a given stage and I can also kind of cherry pick uh, different commits. So does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, can I ask another question? Like, do you make use of any continuous integration or continuous deployment tools? At the moment, not. Um, the thing is, I was a one-man army and uh, my projects were rather small. Um, I totally agree that, that continuous development and continuous integration is a, is a very important role. Um, in my projects, it was... It was um, yeah, not necessary is, is the wrong word, but um, I, I, I never really use them. Do we have any more questions? No? Okay, then thank you very much. And um, if you have any more questions about WordPress, Automatic, by the way, we're still hiring. You can find us in the front at the Automatic table. and. Uh, Enjoy the rest of the day. Um, I hope I see all of you at the after party and make sure don't miss the contributor day tomorrow because tomorrow we, as far as I know, we work on the core, we work on the theme, we probably do a couple of translations and if you really want to get your hands dirty with WordPress and see all the ins and outs, I can highly recommend come tomorrow and see how it actually works under the hood. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the WordCamp.